Um, so yeah, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, submarine swaps, but also just about how we can kind of like reduce trust using Lightning. So Lightning is like a powerful tool where we can do a lot of trade, but it's also the properties of Lightning are such that we can kind of like reduce counterparty risk when we're doing all sorts of different trades. And so submarine swaps is one specific aspect of that that I'm kind of working on right now. Um, so just to kind of like give some background on um, how Lightning works and how submarine swaps works, it's kind of like important to understand uh, the HDLC. Um, and so a lot of people are already familiar with this, but the basic concept is instead of sending to a key pair like you normally send to in Bitcoin, um, so I'm going to send to your key and then only you can spend it. Uh, the HLC kind of like adds some extra conditions onto that. So it says, I'm going to send to your key, but also you need to know this secret. You need to know this pre-image if you're going to spend that money. Um, so it's sent to your key, but you need to know the secret. And the secret is attested to, with the, is committed to with the hash in this contract. Um, and then there's another component to the HTLC, which is that after a certain period of time, uh, it's no longer going to be your money anymore um, with that hash. It's going to be uh, going to another key, and they're going to be able to spend it. Um, so it's got a timeout in there. Um, so that's super important to the Lightning Network. Like that's how uh, Lightning Network like achieves routing. Um, and so there's also some other properties to the Lightning Network uh, that are important to understand in terms of like minimizing trust. Um, and some things that you know people have heard about the Lightning Network, but they don't like completely understand all the aspects of how it works. Um, so this one important thing to realize about Lightning is that you have dual-sided balances. So uh, when you open up a channel, it's not like uh, anybody can pay you and you can pay a limited amount. Um, there's, a, there's a balance there where uh, I can pay a peer a certain amount of money and they can pay me a certain amount of money. And by default, uh, when you connect, when you create a new channel, uh, the money will be on your side. So you'll be able to pay out to your peer and then any, anybody that they can pay out to. Um, but uh, until the, there's a, the balance is on the other side, the, the money won't be able to flow back in your direction. Um, so that's like the dual sided balance concept. Um, so uh, the other important thing to understand is that uh, when you make channels in Lightning, you don't have to make channels with every single person that you ever want to transact with. Uh, it's a routed network, so you can make channels with one person, and as long as they have good capacity and they're connected to the broader network, you can pay to lots of different types of people. Um, and the same applies in reverse. So if you want to get paid from people, you kind of want to have connectivity pointing towards yourself. Um, and then uh, it's also important to understand that like the channels, these are not channels that like you just open up once and then they close. So if you want to pay somebody a penny, that's possible on Lightning, but you can't do it by creating a new channel, paying a penny, and then closing the channel. That's just like wasting Lightning. That's, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so you want the channels to live as long as you possibly can and, and minimize the amount of transactions that you're doing. Um, and then the final super important thing about Lightning is that you have these pre-images. So every time that I get an invoice uh, from a merchant or somebody who I'm going to send money to, they sign a statement that says, uh, here's what you're paying for. And inside this invoice, uh, it has a hash, which corresponds to that HTLC hash that I showed before. And uh, when, you pay the, when you pay the invoice, you get a pre-image, and the pre-image proves that you pay that invoice. So that's like a super important part of Lightning uh, when it comes to swaps. Um, so I also want to think about, like, at a high level, what is, where do we want to go? So like, uh, in terms of swaps, Every time you, you send a route of payment in Lightning, you're doing a swap. What you're doing is I'm swapping some capacity uh, from my channel to one of your channels. And, you're, and if it's routing across multiple, multiple channels, then you're swapping capacity multiple times. And then each time you give somebody a little bit of a fee, uh, depending on their rate, and it says, you know, would you mind moving some of the balance over from your local side to over to the remote side? And I'll make it worth your while by giving a little fee. And then that other person says, Oh, to the next top. Oh, would you would you mind doing that? And then eventually your funds make it to the destination. So in a utopian future of Lightning, um, all the different chains and all the different trade, as much trade as you could possibly uh, as we can possibly manage, will live off chain, and we'll have atomic swaps that just manage how. Uh, how the funds traverse across the network. So like, I have a bunch of Litecoin, and the merchant wants a bunch of Bitcoin, 
we should be able to just pay that Litecoin into the network and it should just solve that, solve the uh, routing and the merchant gets what he wants and I pay people what I want. So that's like the ideal case and none of these trades ever have to hit the chain. Um, but that doesn't, like the ideal case is not what we have today. We don't even really have Litecoin and Bitcoin integration right now. We're still working on Bitcoin integration. And it might never be the case for like large classes of trade um, that we can just do a perfect, perfect blockchain swap that's very minimized trust. Um, so uh, one thing I've been looking at is different ways that we can do swaps and also minimize counterparty risk. Um, I'll kind of like briefly run through different different ways that we can like reduce our risk when we're trading. Um, so the first way that we could do it is to do this thing like where we prove that the merchant. Uh, defraud us. So uh, every time we get an invoice from a merchant, um, that's a signed statement that's saying what the merchant is going to give you. So uh, let's say that I go to a merchant who is selling Litecoin, and uh, like one of those swap services, um, like Shapeshift or something, and they give me an invoice to pay, and they say, pay me some Bitcoin over Lightning, and then uh, I'll send you back some Litecoin on the, on the chain. So um, what would happen if I paid them Bitcoin through Lightning, but then they never sent me back Litecoin on the chain? Um, I could probably go to like a forum online or something and complain. They never sent it back. They never sent it to me. They never sent sent, sent me my, my coin. Um, but one thing that we can do with the signed invoice that we have from Lightning is that we can say, look, hey, everybody on this forum, I'm not lying to you. Here's an invoice attesting to that within a day they promised to send to this address this amount of Litecoin and go look at the Litecoin chain. Did that ever happen? And not only do I have the signed invoice, I also have the pre-image that proves that they that I sent the I released the funds to them. And so everybody then can take a look at that and they can say, oh well, that service definitely cheated you. Um, and they can do it in a way that's like independent. They can independently check that. And you can you can apply this type of a type of a trade to lots of different things. So like, uh, let's say you're buying a domain name or something. So if you get an invoice that says I'm buying this domain name, and then the guy doesn't actually give you the domain name, well you can you can broadcast a proof to everybody and say look he promised to assign this domain name to this IP and it didn't happen. You can all go and look at that. Um, so that's like an interesting way to like make swaps happen uh, with with minimized trust. So you still get. You still take the risk that they're going to, you know, betray you, but at least uh, you can tell everybody else that and warn them. Um, and that's something also that software can analyze. So you know, people don't even have to be involved in that process. If you can just broadcast an alert, everybody can kind of like validate that themselves using software. Um, so that's also kind of like a similar concept to discrete log swaps, which uh, Tad is working on. Tad Fried is working on kind of a concept where. You can have signed attestations of facts, like what is the Bitcoin uh, US dollar price. And you can include these signed attestations in your trades, so you can do something like, um, like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange does this thing where they allow people to trade futures of Bitcoin, but they actually settle in dollars. So uh, we could do, using the discrete log swaps, you could actually do the same thing, but in reverse, where we trade the price of dollar, but we settle in Bitcoin. Um, and Taj has like a demo on, of how that works. Um, and then it, that, re, that relies also on signed statements. So uh, if, like, if the Oracle ever broadcasts an, a, a false statement, you, you'd have to depend, you, you, you still lose your money, but you could have a statement that you can broadcast to everybody and say, look, they, they, they publish a weird dollar value. Um, okay, so another category of swaps is like a tit for tat swap. So, um, imagine that uh, I, I want to trade for a million dollars worth of Bitcoin with somebody, and um, we, we might not trust each other. So uh, we, we, we have this problem of like, who goes first? Uh, do you give me the million dollars of Bitcoin, or do I give you the million dollars worth of fiat? Um, so that's not a great way to trade. So what you could do is you could do like an iterated prisoner's dilemma swap, where you say, I'll give you a dollar and you give me a dollar worth of Bitcoin. I'll give you a dollar and you give me a dollar worth of Bitcoin. And because Lightning is super fast, um, this is like achievable even, even if you did a million, as long as the other side is, is also fast and cheap. Um, so that's tit for tat swaps. That's also like a pretty flexible way 
to like lower your risk. So if the other side betrays you, well, you lost a dollar, you didn't lose a million dollars. That's pretty good. Um, so related to that are like uh, proof of work rental swaps. So like, let's say that I am really excited about this altcoin, and it's proof of work altcoin. Um, so maybe I want to get some, but you know, there's not a lot of good exchanges where I can buy it. What I could do is I could go to a mining company that is willing to rent me hash power, and we'll just hash whatever I tell them to hash, and I can tell them, look, I'll pay you in Bitcoin every minute, and uh, you, you give me the proceeds of what I'm mining uh, back in this other coin. And then as soon as you don't give me the proceeds of what I'm, for what I'm earning in the other coin, I'll stop paying you in Bitcoin. And so all that I'm risking is just a marginal amount. So I can you know, mine a million dollars worth of uh, this other coin without really risking too much that they're going to you know, betray me. Um, and the, other, the, like, the final kind of like, uh, swap that I think is super interesting is this like, Dash HTLC swaps. Um, I don't know like, what the proper name for it is. But the basic HTLC dash blocks. Um, so the um, also like it's intimidating to explain it, but kind of like I was thinking about this idea, which is like, uh, what if I could buy data, but I didn't have to, um, I didn't have to trust the other side is actually giving me the, you know, the data that I that I want. Um, so. Every time, if you go back to that pre-image and hash, every time you pay an invoice, you get a pre-image. And normally the pre-images are just these random garbage data that's, that are a secret. But what if we could actually put data into the pre-images and put data that people would want? Well, the pre-images are only 32 bytes, they're pretty small. So like, what kind of data would you really want in 32 bytes? But what if you could uh, break files up into lots of small pieces? And we can also play with the, the amount of bytes that the pre-image is. And what if we could, we could break the file up into lots of different pieces, and then every time we, we connected to somebody and bought some information, bought some data from another person, uh, we made them give us a, a proof that the data that we're buying uh, has, a, has a Merkle proof that leads back to a well-known root of the file that we're buying. So like if we're buying, like let's say we're buying the blockchain. So we want to buy all the data in the blockchain. Um, we say, hey, uh, what, are you willing to, uh, to provide that to me? And so they say, okay, look, we've got these little chunks, and this is a well-known Merkle root that covers the blockchain, and everybody knows that this is like what the, what the uh, Merkle root is supposed to be. And they could say, uh, here, I'll give you this component, this little piece of it, and then um, when you pay me, there's no way that I can betray you, because you always know that you're going to get the pre-image that matches that hash. Um, and that's even better than, you could do something like this with a tit for tat swap. So you could say, like, I'm going to give you a little bit of information, a little bit of money, and then you give me a little bit of information. But tip or task swap has all sorts of has certain flaws. So like, what if I Sybil attack and make a million different uh, providers of this information, and then you connect to me, and uh, I just betray you immediately, and so I'm actually making a bunch of money because you're trying a lot of people who are all betraying you. So this is a way where they can't betray you, and it's uh, it's a pretty cool, exciting way that we can do swaps for information. Um, so submarine swaps are kind of like. Uh, the last component, and that's what I'm working on, so I'll go into that in more detail. Um, so submarine swap is like a super simplified version of a payment channel. Um, it's like a one-use payment channel. So I said before, like, it wouldn't make sense if you just did uh, open up a payment channel and then closed immediately. Well, on some chains, that's not actually that bad. Or in some situations, it's not actually that bad that you're just doing a, a trade that's uh, off-chain. Um, and the, it's, it's very simple to execute this. So if we're in a, an idealized world where everybody is running Lightning and every chain is, every swap is off-chain, that's great, but that also means like developing Lightning compatible implementations for all the different coins. And that's gonna be a long ways off, and it might never, never work for all coins. There are certain coins, I don't think that they'll ever have, and we'll never have enough confidence in their chain that it makes sense to broadcast, like to trust unconfirmed transactions. Like, uh, I'll never trust that in the future I'll be able to broadcast this un unconfirmed transaction to a chain where they're changing the rules all the time. So a submarine swap is the HTLC contract, but very simplified. Um, it's, it's, and it, it's, it's uh, a swap where you, you trade on-chain funds for off-chain funds. 
And so the, the on-chain part, um, I just take that, the, we just take this, uh, the pre-image and hash the invoice ID um, that's part of every lightning invoice, and we say, uh, if you know the pre-image, you'll be able to take this money. So first, I'll put some money on the, on the chain, and it'll be locked to you, plus the, the pre-image that corresponds to the invoice's hash. And then I'll pay into this, I'll pay into this contract, and then uh, I'll give you an invoice. And you'll want to pay this invoice because you know that by paying the invoice, you'll see the pre-image that corresponds to the invoice ID, and so uh, then you'll be able to take the chain fund. And so this way, we've kind of done a swap where we've said, uh, I paid on chain, and you've got paid off off chain. So uh, I kind of uh, want to show a demo of like how this actually works in practice. So this is like a real demo that I tried, like the first time that I tried it, which is that I have like my Lightning wallet, and I want to fund it with Bitcoins, and I want to pay with Litecoin on the chain um, to fund my, my Lightning wallet. Um, so somebody else created this, but uh, uh, it's kind of a fork of a project that I'm working on, which is a submarine swaps project. Um, so here, I went to a swap provider, and I said, give me an address. Um, I really want to deposit some funds into my Bitcoin wallet, but I only have Litecoin. So they said, okay, here's a Litecoin address. Set this amount to this Litecoin address and commit it to that hash and that pre-image uh, and to the key of the swap provider. So I said, okay, I'll, use, I'll get on my Bitcoin, Bitcoin wallet and I'll, it will send you some test Litecoins. And once those are confirmed on the chain, please pay this invoice for me and my htlc.me wallet will be funded with a bunch of Bitcoins and I'll be happy now. That I'm connected to the Lightning Network. So here I've sent the, I've confirmed that I've sent on the chain, this is like on the real testnet, um, I've sent the funds. Um, and so I'm going to have to wait a little while for, for the transaction to, to complete. And in this situation, maybe it's one confirmation, but it could be more confirmations. Um, and there's like a, there's a fee that I have to pay to the provider, whoever's doing this swap for me. But now I can see that the, it did confirm, and now I've got my, my Bitcoin Lightning Wallet funded, and I all and I spent Litecoin to do that. Um, so thinking about submarine swaps, like at a high level, I try to think about like what are the use cases, and to think about the use cases, like who are the people who are in the, like our ecosystem, and so I'd say like there are four types of people. There are like people who are selling stuff. There's people who are like the hodlers, who are the buyers, the speculators. Um, there are people who are like launching new coins, and then there's the exchanges who are just like facilitating all of the gambling and speculating. <laughs> um, so, uh, just to go one by one through them, like how, what, what are their needs going to be? Um, so, the first one is like, what are merchants on Lightning going to need? So, like in the Lightning world, where where all of the merchants are doing great business on Lightning or getting into Lightning, and you know, I'm a merchant on Lightning. I have like the all side org, and if you want to buy articles. I'm going to sell them to you. So, um, thinking about a merchant, what a merchant wants in the Lightning world is they want to maximize the amount of people who can pay them. And they actually want to minimize the amount of money that they can pay out. So, a merchant doesn't really need to pay out too much, but they, want to, they really want people to be able to pay them very easily. Um, so, to use a submarine swap, using a submarine swap, they can kind of accomplish uh, this goal, which is that. Uh, if they want more remote balance and they want less local balance, they can just swap with people. So they can, what they can do is they can go to a peer and say, "Hey, give me a Lightning invoice to pay." Because all, the other the other aspect to Lightning Network is that you can always get more local balance. You can always create a bunch of channels to anybody. Anybody's happy to create a channel with you. But what you can't really get is remote balance. People pay, people able to pay you. You can't just go to arbitrary people and say, "Can you make channels with me with all your money on your side?" Because what if they're gonna, you're just going to be a bad citizen and lock up all their money? So we can kind of marketize this problem and say uh, you, you can have peers who are like willing to provide this remote, or remote capacity. And not all capacity is created equal. Uh, if you have a, a lone guy out there, you, know, you don't want remote capacity from him. You want capacity from people who are connected to your potential customers. And every person is different. So you know, a certain set of customers are going to be different on one side, and different customers are going to be different for another merchant. Um, so they can use this kind of swap to say, let's rebalance the channel. 
So I've created I've created a bunch of channels and a bunch of the and a bunch of the uh, money on the channels is on my side, but I want it to be on your side. So I want to pay an invoice on your side. So give me one of these invoices on your side, and I'll and I'll pay it. But I don't just want to pay the invoice. I want to get the money back. And also, I don't want to just trust you. I I want to have this be uh, you know a swap where if I pay the invoice, I get the money back for sure. Um, so they can kind of do this the flow that I just showed, but in reverse. Um, so what are some ways that users can, can like users, hodlers, how can they use Lightning? Um, again, the, the like the demo that I showed, which is uh, what if I wanted to pay into a Lightning invoice, but I just I just am not able to. Maybe I don't have capacity, or maybe I don't have that coin. Um, maybe uh, you know I haven't gotten around to installing a Bitcoin wallet yet or a Lightning wallet yet. Um, so I can use whatever coin I want. And I can pay, you know, an inefficient on-chain transaction, but maybe on a different chain where things are fast and cheap. And um, that Lightning invoice, that, that Lightning merchant is going to get paid, and I'm going to get my hack or whatever I'm going to buy from that merchant. Um, so another thing that uh, could be useful is like everybody's got all these fork coins. You probably have more fork coins than you even know. So the <laughs> and it's pain to it's a pain to, to claim them, uh, you know, and. Are they ever going to really be connected to the Lightning Network? Is somebody going to create a Lightning Wallet for every one of these different port coins? Um, are you going to manage channels? Are you going to spin up a, a Lightning Demon for all these different things? Uh, what you really want is you want to get rid of them. So you could create like a wallet that says, uh, I have only one purpose. I look for port coins, and I get rid of them. And I get rid of them in a way that's kind of uh, a way that can be uh, spread out to even less trustworthy it doesn't matter if you have to trust it, the person who's swapping you because uh, they're going to they're they're going to just be refilling your Bitcoin channels and you're not going to have to be worried that they're going to not pay you pay pay you back. Um, another way that another way that swapping could be useful is that um, there's this concept where coins in Bitcoin are not all created equal. It's kind of like a it's a problem, right? Um, like I I was banned from Circle. And you know, I, I emailed them like, why am I why am I banned from Circle? And they're like, well, I don't know why. You know, we can't tell you. And but I knew why. The reason why is I gave them some coins which they believed are bad. And everybody knows this. You don't go and spend some coins at some risky places and then deposit it on one of the exchanges because they have it in their mind that some coins are good and some coins are bad. And that's just like a reality. Um, but once we're able to swap with people, you could have somebody who's able to create coins that look good. And if you had a tool that could, you, you had the same tool, that, a similar tool that the exchange would use, you could take a look at these coins and you could say, oh, this guy's going to give me some good UTXOs. Those are, those are UTXOs that I like. And I'll give him some UTXOs and he specializes in cleaning UTXOs, making them look great. And, uh, and I'll, get, I'll take all my UTXOs that seem bad for whatever reason and I'll make them look better, make them look, look a little bit better. So it'll be kind of like a weak, a weak anonymity tool. Um, another way that, so there's all sorts of ways that users can kind of use swaps, that people might want to swap coins. Um, like, let's say you open up a bunch of channels and you just spent them down, you've just you know, gone on a shopping spree. Well, you might not want to make, if you have other coins, you might, and the fees on Bitcoin are high, you might just want to use these other coins to like, recharge your channel so you can buy some more stuff on Bitcoin. Um, another way that you could use the swap is that you could go with, go out with your friends and you have a lightning invoice and you want to split the bill and you're, you're really geeky and you're, you love cryptography. <laughs> well, so you can say, well, let's, let's pay a bunch of different outputs and the swap provider is smart and he'll look at all the different outputs and he'll say, all these other different outputs are good enough for me and now I really want to pay this invoice to get the free image to unlock all these outputs and claim them all. Um, and you could, you could also do things like um, something that I'm pretty excited about, which is that wallets could actually become smarter about figuring out what you want to do with your coins on, by itself. So that's one of the great things about lowering trust and reducing counterparty risk, is that the wallets can start to like, make trades on your behalf. So you could say, I only want to keep 5% of my portfolio in my coin. And like, here are the exchanges that I, I trust, and here's the rates, and here's the parameters of what I want. 
I want to deal with, and then it can go out and say, okay, I'll make those trades for you. I'll keep the, I'll keep your, your portfolio percentage of 5%, and every week I'll ask you, are you happy at 5%, or do you want to go to 10% or 2%, and it can automatically be doing that for you. Um, so the one twist on HTLC that I've made for users is I've tried to make it very easy to work with uh, a submarine swap. So ideally, a submarine swap can be that the swap provider gives you a normal address and you can use any wallet, even other wallets. You pay to this one address and then your invoice gets paid. And like that can be a super easy user flow because you need no software for that. You just, the swap provider gives you a, in, a chain invoice, you pay the chain invoice, the uh, lightning invoice gets paid. So the way that I've done this to try to like minimize risk in that flow is that, uh, well, you need a key, which is going to be the key used to get your money back. So that's why normally you would need software to actually make a, a, one of these swaps work. You would normally need a, the software to say, what's my key? What's the key going to be after the timeout? Who's going to get that money? So what I do is I take the normal uh, pay to public key hash, and I say, I'll use that as a key. So just generate a normal address. It, it might not work so well with like, random script addresses, but you could use it with PK hash addresses. And um, you can plug that in there, and then it just changes the HTLC a little bit by saying, um, I'm going to check the hash of this, and then you also have to supply the public key. Um, so I have kind of a demo from a user perspective. We made this at the SACCON, um, which is like, what would it be like if a service, a swap service, wants to market itself to users and say, you want to pay lightning invoices? And I'll accept a bunch of different coins and you can just pay with your normal wallet. So here's like how easy the flow can be. So like I want to, I run across this emoji that I really want to buy, it costs 60 bucks. So, but I want 60 bucks on my wallet. So I go to the swap provider website and they give me a normal address. And I just pay that with my normal wallet. And, um, it's paying to, that's, this address is paying to the HTLC, and then they say, okay, it's, it's, I paid it, and we forget about that you have to wait for confirmations, then I can see that the emoji has been paid for. So uh, that's like a very simplified user flow, and there can be a minimal amount of software, so we can, we can reduce counterparty risk uh, kind of on a sliding scale. Um, and this is something that is, should be really easy to integrate in lots of different coins. Um, so, you know, I can go to a fork coin, which I really know very little about, and I can just say, you know, is it similar to Bitcoin, is it similar to another coin, and I can, because that script is just basically two branches, right, it says, if coin, if, if key plus hash, send, or if timeout, go back. So, I don't have to implement the whole stack of lightning on, on all these different coins. Um, so, this one thing that I, you know, that I'm trying to emphasize with um, building out submarine swaps is like, I want to support as many different different types of coins as possible. And they also have the advantage, which is that they are usually cheap to execute these, these scripts. Uh, this block space is usually not really contested, and um, they often execute very quickly. Um, OK, so the, and, and also I think tokens themselves, they want to have liquidity. Like, they're begging to be on exchanges. They're paying exchanges to be listed, millions of dollars. They're paying exchange people to integrate them. And um, this is a way that they can offer some liquidity without people, without like relying on the crutch of a trusted exchange to take custody. Um, but exchanges still have their places, still have their place. Um, and I think submarine swaps can be a way that exchanges can kind of like uh, offer on ramps onto the Lightning Network. Um, so, one way that could be interesting is that. Exchanges could uh, use a submarine swap with an outsource partner or with a bunch of outsource partners and say, uh, do you want to get an invoice, do you want to uh, take a lightning withdrawal? And if you want a lightning withdrawal, just give us an invoice and we'll pay the invoice. But actually, the exchange doesn't implement lightning. Instead what they do is they say, they go to a partner, and it could be a random partner, and they say, we'll send you money on the chain because we know how to do that already, we're a normal exchange, we send money on the chain all the time, and you deal with all the lightning stuff, and you pay that invoice, and that's your job. Um, and then you can charge a fee for this, but we're not too worried about this fee, because anybody can do your job. So, um, and we're not risking anything, because if, we, if, 
if we pay you money on the chain, then you have to pay the invoice. So that's a way that I think like exchanges can start to like help integrate Lightning without having to worry about integrating everything. Um, so uh, another way that I think that Lightning can, or that submarine swaps can help is uh, to make non-custodial trade solutions. So a lot of exchanges that are just getting started, um, and a lot of exchanges in general, actually don't want to take custody of coins. There's regulatory problems with taking custody, and there is um, risk. Like, if I'm sitting on a bunch of coins, then the more the people deposit, the more risk that I have that somebody's gonna take it all. So they wanna kind of, if, if they can create new modes of trade where there's not this custodial risk, I think they'd be interested in, um, or their customers would be interested, or they might be interested in different models, um, especially depending on different markets around the world. Um, another way exchanges can use this is that, you know, if they're a small exchange or just getting started, or they don't have a great liquidity in one market, um, they can kind of like reach out to the marketplace of different people who are offering liquidity. And they can say, you know, we have this lightweight connection. We don't have to like create bonds with you and create a bunch of legal contracts with you. So that if we ever run low on our marketplace, just like Coinbase used to do uh, when they were selling coins, they used to go out to Mt. Gox and say, please give us some coins. And they, you know, go out to Bitfinex. Um, so they could fill, they could backfill their marketplace in, in case demand runs to, runs out the order book. Um, so uh, other kind of concepts that I think that exchanges can really work with submarine swaps is that uh, they can use their capacity and get rid of it. So like imagine if an exchange has a bunch of capacity that they don't need. Um, they have too much inbound capacity or they have too much outbound capacity. Uh, so like, let's say they have a bunch of inbound capacity. Well, you know who wants that is merchants. So they can go to merchants and they can say, you want a bunch of inbound capacity? We've got a bunch of it. So they can, they can go and you know, kind of set, up, set, set agreements or offer self-service software that anybody can kind of go to an exchange and say, oh, I want some good, I want some of that inbound capacity from all your customers so that they can all, they can all pay me. Um, and they, they, you can even relay a submarine swap. So uh, it can only go in one direction. But let's say that I'm a swap provider, and I'm agreeing to pay people's lightning invoices if they send me money on the chain. So some, let's say uh, we, we negotiate a new trade with, with somebody, and they give me this invoice, and then I realize that I can't pay it. I actually don't have capacity to that route, because you never really know if you can pay an invoice. It's something that you just have to try. You have a bunch of different routes, but you don't know if those nodes are actually online or not. So you have to just try it, and maybe you can't pay. Um, in that situation, you could say, you could go out to a backup provider. You could go out to an exchange, and you could say, hey, I need you to pay this invoice for me. But, but the exchange has the same problem that you do. They don't want to just pay invoices on your behalf without getting paid back. So uh, you could say, okay, I'll commit some money to you, and then once I've committed money to you, you pay this invoice. So you, and then they could even do the same thing. So you could change it in that way. Okay, so I kind of covered a lot of different use cases, um, but I, might have glossed over some of the problems. And there's a lot of problems. Um, so, and yeah, that's something that, I, you know, that I'm working on. This is a big challenging project. Um, so number one is like uh, a decentralized marketplace. I'm, I'm not even tackling how to solve, how to figure out how to find these providers. Like uh, in my model, you just go to a website. But like, how do you know which website to go to? How do you know what rates people are, are doing? How do you know people are good or not? So that's like a big open problem of like, how do we know if rates are good? How do we find these swap providers? How do we know about liquidity? How do the people who are swap providing, how do they map uh, requests into maybe their exchange accounts, things like that. Um, another problem is incentives have to be uh, thought about really carefully. So like in my demo uh, of paying for an invoice after, you, after you've committed funds on the change, that works because I went to the website and I sought them out, and then I paid on the chain. But what if it happened in the reverse? If I generated the invoice, and then I said, please send, please, I just went to this arbitrary website, and I said, please, please deposit some money on the chain to me. Well, what if I created a thousand different accounts, a thousand different IP addresses, and then I went to them and I said, oh, please send some money to me on the chain. Well, they'd have to send some money to me on the chain, so they'd lock up all their capital, and they'd also be out of the, the if, I, if I don't pay the invoices, then they're out all of the transaction fees when they have to take their refunds. So um, 
there's ways to deal with that, but you know you have to think about that. Like that's why I haven't offered the other the other uh, the other flow, the reverse flow. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, another thing to think about that people overlook kind of in lightning is that although the lightning trades can happen instantly, they don't actually have to happen instantly. And you can have this problem that that's kind of like a problem with all types of swaps, which is what if the other side is a bad guy, and instead of completing the swap, he just hangs on to it. Because what you've given him is a free option. You've said, I'm willing to give you this amount of Bitcoin if you give me this amount of Litecoin. And so what he does is he's just like, okay, I'll run out the clock. I'll just wait for the, for the volatility in the market to change a bunch. And then once the, once the volatility in the market favors me, then I'll execute it. If it, if it never favors me, I'm just going to time it out. I'm just going to make you wait. Um, and this is actually even a problem in Lightning overall, which is that if you, you can, uh, it's actually a problem with Bitcoin. What if I go to BitPay and they've given me a, a rate and then the market moves, totally moves. I could actually script this and create lots of, lots of different invoices and then I could always pay a favorable, favorable rate to me. Um, so that's something to think about, um, like how to deal with that. And there's lots of good ideas about how to, how to think about it and you can cover it with like a, you, you can cover it with like the spread that you charge. You can cover it with your fees, but it's still a problem. Um, so another issue is like, Currently in Lightning Network, you can only send like 400 bucks. So, you know, for big trades, you gotta do a bunch of different trades. Um, another problem is, if you're doing a submarine swap, well, you're gonna go as fast as the chain goes. You're no longer gonna go as fast as Lightning goes. You're gonna have to be stuck there waiting for confirmations. Um, so, the invoice might time out. Invoices come with a default of one hour. So, uh, if nobody changes the default, and there's a really slow block, well, you're, you're in trouble. Um, another problem with submarine swaps, especially if, if we execute them on Bitcoin, is that they actually require a bunch of blockchain space. Um, so ideally, we would be trying to minimize blockchain space, and we'd be encouraging people to get, get with the program and get Lightning wallets, and don't pay swap providers you know, in Bitcoin for paying Bitcoin Lightning invoices. Um, so, and then the final thing is just like, if you're implementing this, so I try to avoid saying the word atomic, because they aren't atomic unless you make them atomic. So if you forget, like let's say you get this funds that are locked to your address, and you forget to pay, you forget to sweep, you forget to take the, the, the funds that you could take, well, the clock will run out and they can take their refund. So you just got, you know, you just lost the money. Um, so what I'm working on is this, is this project called Swap Service. Um, it's under like the GitHub org, org, org as submarine swaps. And basically what I'm trying to do is like make a practical implementation of a swap providing service that anybody could do. And then also to try to make it so that there's uh, adapt chain, like different adapters for different chains so that uh, we can offer like a wide variety of pairs between stuff that's on Lightning and stuff that's off chain. Um, so different things that I'm building out are kind of like a, it's kind of like a, a mini wallet. So it's like, I need to watch the chain to see if I've got any money coming in. And I need to watch the chain to see if I should execute a swap. And uh, also there's UI components, like how does the user actually do a refund? How do they validate that the, that the redeem script is actually a good redeem script? Like, especially if they're dealing with somebody that, that's really untrustworthy, you want them to be able to look at the redeem script and say, this is actually like a good swap script. I, I can make sure that this actually pays your key like you expect it to, and um, I want to make that super easy. I'm doing everything in JavaScript, and as an NPM, I'm going to try to make it as an NPM library, um, and then try to reach out to other people and see if this kind of core concept, which is just HTLC script, can kind of be incorporated into different solutions. Um, so currently, like the project is kind of like a proof of concept stage. Um, some guy who was pretty awesome just made that Litecoin integration work, but uh, I really have to abstract the code base. Uh, he just replaced Bitcoin with Litecoin, but I need to make it supportable for a bunch of different things. You need to think about the data model of like you have all of these different components. You have invoices on different networks. You have coin. You have uh, UTXOs on different networks, um, and the you know I'm still working on that. And also documentation, just so that people can understand this, and people can understand also how to make their own adapters, so that if, if you have a different coin, you want to bring in a fork coin, um, that you understand how to actually add that in as an adapter. Um, okay, so just to close, like 
the one, uh, one point that I like want to get back to is that uh, it can be intimidating like in this space because we have like amazing people who are working on like amazing projects like Bitcoin Core and Lightning Demon and you might think that you are not like capable of operating at their level and what I see happen a lot of times is that people kind of give up on trust minimization. They just say, well, I'm not that guy. You know, I'm not like Mr. Wizard. I don't know how to make trust, trust minimization. So let's just skip that for the time being. And you know, I'll just leave it to them once they have a solution that works out of the box. But uh, I think that's a big, big mistake. Like, I think people can, all you have to do is really think about it and you know, make an effort. And you don't have to be uh, you know, an amazing, you don't have to leave all the work to them. And they're going to get frustrated too. Those type of people who are contributing, and then they're making all of this stuff, and you're not even trying. Like, I think that's just like a, a bad situation. So what I'd like to see more of is like people actually try to make things uh, to reduce counterparty risk. Um, so I'm doing my best at it because I'm not an amazing lightning protocol developer. I'm just you know a guy out there who's making some code and. Uh, so I've open source this submarine swaps MIT license, and uh, I'm also working on a Lightning integration project so that it's easy to integrate uh, Lightning Daemon, and you can just get get going in a few lines of code onto creating invoices and paying invoices, and all this code. That's what uh, I'm using for yalt.org and htlc.me. Um, so all of those components, I'm just trying to make them like drop in, and you can just do npm install, and you can get going and make amazing apps. for the talk. I'm sure that a few people might have some questions. So we'll be going around and giving the microphone to people that want to ask something. Oh. Hey, would you? First of all, thank you very much for presenting. I was wondering if you could show some of the output scripts uh, for the summary slots in your GitHub. Um, well, if you go to this link, there's a bunch, there's different, there's different scripts. So if you go to like the third link, um, I've kind of got an explanation of them. I kind of avoided uh, showing exactly how the scripts work because like, it's complicated to think about how they work. Like, uh, it, uh, that's why I made the pseudocode about them. So like, um, if you go back to like, the HTLC, like, um, so I've got on the GitHub kind of like a commented version of how this pseudocode maps into the actual script and all the script elements are made. And I use Bitcoin JS lib and uh, plug in all the opcodes as components. I have a question for you. One of the things that I'm seeing with Lightning, especially when we start talking about these things, is you're um, allowing people to, to uh, create a reputation around their nodes. Um, uh, I mean, so in a, set, in a sense, it's unlike Bitcoin where you have an address and you're never supposed to use it again. You're reusing these nodes over and over again. Uh, do you have any thoughts as far as you know, persistence or how long nodes are or how you can create a new node that basically can prove that it's offering the same services that the old node did, or do you have any you know, thoughts around persistence of identity and reputation in the uh, Lightning world? Um, I think it's kind of like a dual-edged sword. So, like, it could be bad that we have these per persistent identities because, like, it, people have to think about it. Like, let's say I withdraw from an exchange on one site, and then I don't really think about it, but I withdraw on another site. And they're both sending to my same public key. So now they can link me. And they know that that identity is the same. So that could be a, a bad aspect to it. Um, a good aspect to it could be um, that these are identities that are not just like you're building reputation around. You also like are committing uh, monetary uh, assets to, right? So like uh, I can look at the transaction fees that are related to this node. Um, I can look at my past history of interacting with this node. Um, so, like, I actually think that can be a big tool for solving problems. Um, but from the perspective of like um, my my interactions with it, like uh, the more that I interact with it, um, the more that I like I can you know I can say uh, now whenever I go to y'all's, like I kind of know the, the the payment flow with them. So I don't want to like like on Bitcoin Core when you pay, it's like it'll give you a little countdown. It's like one, two, three, then pay. So I could just say, uh, you know, if I trust this node, don't give it a countdown. Um, and you could even say, 
things like um, like uh, automatically pay every month, you know, and as long as the node doesn't change, I won't send you an email saying, are you sure you want to pay for the service? Can you pay for the service? I mean, I think there's a lot that can be done with it, but there's some problems that you know, kind of have to be avoided. Thanks for the excellent talk. Um, I have a follow-up question on what you just described uh, regarding knowing the history of a provider and uh, knowing whether it's trustable or not. Uh, do you imagine that as uh, that itself, the, the, the trusting, uh, trustiness of a, of a provider as a separate service, or do you expect everyone to just maintain that history and then, and then on their own decide whether they're trusted or not? Or? That's I mean, that's a hard problem. For yeah. Yeah, that's kind of like what I listed in the problems of like, I don't know exactly how that will work out. What I'm trying to do is like make a proof of concept and other people kind of like plug that into other solutions. There's a lot of people working on swaps and working on atomic swaps. And I actually think that that's, you know, there's going to be like a coalescing. Like these, all of these different decentralized marketplaces, you can create adapters from one to another. And it, I think it'll like be a market process that figures out like what's the best way to figure out who should I swap with. Um, so you know, it could be that it, it could be somewhat centralized, it could be decentralized. I'm not sure about the exact solution to it. Thanks for sharing so many interesting ideas. Um, I was wondering how you give users a way to trustlessly monitor monitor the different nodes and check to see if. There's been a transaction that's broadcasted. How you can do that trustlessly, not having it backed by y'alls or some service. So, how do they monitor on which side? Like, what are they doing? What's this user doing? They're just trying to send from one chain to the other, and they need to look at both of the chains. Well, so the the, the swap provider is the one who needs to really worry about the chain. The user doesn't have to care about the chain. Um, all the user has to worry about, because eventually the user is either going to have the invoice paid, like they wanted it to be paid, or the invoice was never paid, and then they need to get their refund. So uh, one thing that I didn't show, um, which is if what happens if things go wrong? In that case, you need to go to software. You need to say, oh, I need to get that key that corresponds to that, that address that I made, and they need to plug that into this refund script, and uh, I need to actually go find that UTXO. And so, um, that's one thing that I'm really working on right now is to make it um, make it really easy to find that UTXO and then craft that transaction and in a way where you don't need the, the server to be gone. You could use like a wallet component. You could download a web page, and the web page could just do it. Um, and uh, also, uh, one thing that I have that I'm working on in the swap service is that it will feed you that information. So as you're watching the as you're watching the trade, the server will let you know like, oh, I saw this unconfirmed transaction. And once you know that the transaction ID, like nine times out of 10, that's all you really need uh, to do the whole thing offline. So I could give you like a file to save and say, if this didn't work out, load this file, um, or here's a redeem script, and uh, here's the transaction details, and maybe I can make that in a standardized way. So that's something else I've been thinking about. It's like, how can I make these redeem scripts and these refund things in a standard way? They can be plugged into different things. Um, I've seen Bitcoin Core is working. There's some bits about like how to deal with like strange redeem scripts. Um, so that's, that's one thing I'm working on or looking into. The talk, uh, I really enjoyed how you spoke about uh, sweeping or at least uh, swapping forked coins. And I was curious uh, if you could speak to the fungibility. I'd love to uh, dump all the forks without complicating next year's tax return. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that it's strong anonymity. So I would really be careful about, like, you know, saying that once your coins are, because people say, oh, lightning, once it goes into lightning, it's invisible. It's like, it's magic now. But and that's, so that's not what happens, right? Like, if you are a serious, if you're a serious uh, person who cares about figuring out who's linked to whom, then you, they're going to find you. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust that part. Um, and I think that, it's like, that, that might even be an unsolvable problem. Like, uh, w once you have those four coins, I think they're like indelibly linked to you and that you're not gonna, there's no solution. But, um, 
you know, it, it, it might be useful in situations where you kind of want to just have a weak set of protections, where, you know, um, you know that, oh, this, this, this service or whatever, they don't like this one other thing, and they're not going to spend too much time on it. You're just going to be the slowest, you know, you don't have to be faster than your, than the bear, you have to be faster than your friend who's trying to outrun the bear. So this could be a way to kind of like outrun your friend. <laughs> You said that uh, the other direction is a lot more complicated. Can you give the notes why? Well, so yeah, the, just the problem is that, um, well, one thing that you really want is that you want to not pay out to the, uh, you don't want to pay out to a swap address. So that's what you're doing when you're making the swap, is you're paying out to the HTLC that I showed. That's the address, that's inside the address. But if you're swapping, you don't want to pay to, like services don't create swap addresses for you. So what they'll create is a normal address. So what you want is to be able to pay a lightning invoice, and then that payment, you want a swap provider to say, if you pay me a lightning, I'll pay on the chain for any coin. So uh, now if you go to a website and they accept, you know, Litecoin or whatever, um, they, just, they just accept on-chain Litecoin, uh, you want to make it so that you can pay in Lightning, and then that swap provider will pay in Litecoin. Um, but uh, there's more software involved, because uh, you kind of have to make a chain of transactions that say, uh, okay, first I know that, these, that I have these signed transactions, and I have this commitment, um, and there's software on the side to like, figure out if you actually have that. So it's not like just, oh, send to an address, and then it swaps. You. Um, I was just wondering if you see any compatibility issues when Lightning uh, starts allowing splicing for channels? Well, splicing is kind of the ideal situation. So, like, uh, so just like what I was talking about, where you want to pay out to a chain address, once you have splicing, you can just pay out to it. Like, once, once the Lightning uh, daemons implement splicing, you can just pay out to the chain address. You don't even have to stop the channel. You just pay out to the address that you want, as long as it's on the same chain. If it's on a different chain, then splicing can't work. Like, you, you can't splice in a Litecoin input into your Bitcoin channel. That doesn't really make sense, um, as far as I know. Yeah. 